Imagine, demand, and build a world transformed. Welcome, everyone, um, to the World Transform event this evening. Um, Decades of Labour and Anti-Racism, A History of Struggle and Hope. Uh, this is a, a joint collaboration between uh, Labour Against Racism and Fascism and the Socialists of Colour, um, who have teamed up today to explore the four decades of the Labour Party and the trade union movement's relationship with racism. They're going to have plenty to say on that one. Um, we will be hearing from activists, from academics, from historians alongside uh, politicians as well, um, and involved in both the long-standing and recent struggles against racism. So, um, without any uh, further to do, actually, before I um, start going into um, who we have in the lineup, there's a couple of things that I wanted to mention. Um, whether online or in physical spaces, TWT is about creating an environment uh, where people can learn and debate with each other in a spirit of kindness and respect. We want every single person this evening to be able to feel welcome in these spaces and for everyone's voices to be heard. So please bear this in mind uh, when engaging with uh, chat um, in the comment boxes during the sessions. Please don't use inappropriate, rude or unkind language um, and please don't spam. Uh, participants who violate these principles may be prevented from further posting in the chat or the comment box. Comment box. TWT is free for all, but it is only made possible by your contributions um, and the contributions of our supporters. If you are able to please consider supporting us, uh, you can do so um, at theworldtransform.org forward slash support forward slash to help sustain the work that we do all year round. So um, I'm going to go straight in to um, our next uh, speaker. Um, and our speaker is Diane Nunless, the uh, Diane Abbott, the amazing Diane Abbott, um, the Labour MP for Hackney North and Stoke Newington. She's also the former Shadow Home Secretary. Um, Diane, it's uh, a real pleasure to have you with us today, and I know that you are going to have plenty to talk about. But in relation to this evening's discussion, we were hoping that you could speak about um, anti-racism in the 80s and 90s um, and, and what it was like then, so that the rest of us can take us on to the bigger journey in terms of where we are today. So over to you, Diane. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to speak for a few minutes, actually, about the labour movement and anti-racism over the centuries, because one of the things to remember is there's nothing that people are saying about Eastern European migrants today that wasn't said about the Irish in the 19th century. And in 1870, Karl Marx had to write to his followers in London to try and get them to see how divisive and futile the anti-Irish racism you had in the working class of that time was to the working class movement. Just as now, people said that Irish migrants were driving down wages, everything you hear today about Eastern Europeans. Marx wrote an essay on this, and the final paragraph I will actually repeat, he's talking about the antagonism between English workers and Irish workers, and he says, this antagonism is artificially kept alive and intensified by the press, the pulpit, and the comic papers. In short, it's kept alive by all the means at the disposal of the ruling classes. And this antagonism is the secret of the impotence of the English working class, despite its organization. It's the secret by which the capitalist class maintains its power. And the latter is quite aware of this. And it's an important point that being anti-racist and supporting fellow workers, whatever their color and creed, isn't just about being nice to people, 
the working class as a whole is stronger if white workers and black and minority ethnic workers stand shoulder to shoulder. So we're not talking about something new, we're something which goes back almost to the time of the Industrial Revolution, where different groups of workers, the ruling class play, divide and rule. Immediately after the Second World War, we saw a steady stream of racist immigration and asylum legislation, some of it sadly passed by Labour governments. It's a Labour government that passed legislation, which means that if you want to use a hospital or a doctor, you have to show your passport. And most recently, some of us in the 80s, looking at state of anti-racism in the party, looking at what little black representation, there were no black MPs um, in the mid 80s at all, no black, no minority ethnic MPs. And yet there were big issues about racial justice, notably what we call at the time, the scrap sus campaign. Sus was the, the what, how they described what we call stop and search today. So there was a lack of representation, there were big issues, there were black workers exploited, there was an immigration system that was institutionally racist. And some of us felt that the Labour Party should do more. And so we set up a campaign called the Black Sections Campaign. It was a campaign on the face of it to have black sections in the Labour Party, just have you as you have youth sections and women's sections. We also talked about the need for more black councillors and more black MPs, but it was really a campaign about racial justice, using these, these constitutional demands for a black section and so on as a vehicle for talking about racial justice. And I'm sorry to say that it wasn't greeted with complete um, enthusiasm by the Labour leadership of the time. Um, they felt it was dangerous left-wing uh, nonsense. And one very senior uh, leader in the party warned us against stirring up what he described as his Asians. That a senior Labour Party MP should talk about his Asians tells you where race relations of the party was in the 80s. And sadly, after the war, there were some Labour MPs who even expressed their admiration for Enoch Powell. You can Google that. And there were other MPs and Labour councillors who said that housing should be reserved for the indigenous community. And they didn't just say it. In the 50s and 60s, many local authorities had what they called a sons and daughters policy, which meant that you had to be the son or a daughter of somebody already in council housing to get a council house. And what that did in effect is block black and minority ethnic people from accessing council housing. And who, forget, who can forget as recently as 2015 and the general election our immigration pledge on immigration controls and the infamous immigration pledge marks. Now I have to say, I've not heard anybody, although people are embarrassed by the immigration pledge marks now, never heard anybody say, yes, I own up to it, it was my idea. Uh, yes, I had a chance to block it, but I took my eye off the ball. Not one person involved in that 2015 general election campaign. The truth is, those immigration control mugs made the Labour Party sound like a militant but insincere version of UKIP. And sadly, some people are determined not to learn the lesson. I'll tell you a true story about the 2017 election. There was a colleague who packed up all his belongings as Parliament was dissolved. He said goodbye to us all, certain he would lose his seat and never see us again. Um, but instead, thanks to Jeremy Corbyn and the great 2017 manifesto, and no concessions at all to racism in that campaign, my colleague kept his seat and the campaign increased his majority. But he wasn't in Parliament five minutes before he wrote an article saying Labour would have won if it had been tougher on immigration. 
can't make it up. This is not to, you know, put down people for poor judgment or even poor politics, but it does provide a context. You cannot assume that just because people are on the left, they understand issues of racial justice and they understand how toxic anti-immigrant rhetoric is. Now, politicians, whether they're UKIP, whether they're Tories, who have played, whether it's Boris Johnson himself, who played dog whistle politics or play divide and rule, don't do it because they're nasty, although I'll leave you to judge how nasty some of them are. They do it because it works. They feel that some parts of the population will buy this rubbish. In countries like Britain, in France, Germany, Italy, Spain, and of course the United States, under Donald Trump, you can appeal to racism and gain support. You can appeal to racism and even sometimes win. There's a president in the United States now who's openly encouraging not just racists, but armed white supremacists. And what do all these countries have in common? They've all launched colonial wars, wars of acquisition and domination. Some of them, including Britain itself, had large and successful empires. So as Labour Party members, it's not just about fighting the Nick Griffins and the EDL and the UKIP. It's being, being very clear about how wrong racism and anti-immigrant rhetoric is in the labor, labor movement as a whole. And, you know, I've heard people in the labor movement who should know better, giving us that old 18th century argument that immigrants drive down wages. Well, Eastern European immigrants don't drive wages any more than the Irish did in the 18th century. Sorry about that. No, so uh, something we should always have to push back on is the idea that immigrants drive down wages um, or that immigrants are responsible for low paid jobs, poor education and bad housing. The reason for low paid jobs and low wages is not immigration, it's predatory employers globalization and the weakening over the years of trade union rights and freedoms. So this is the nature of the problem we're dealing with and it's formed by our whole history as a country. And the Labour Party is part of that society. Many Labour Party people have always fought racism, but it's not just the society as a whole that needs to be watched for on, about racism and anti-immigrant rhetoric, the Labour Party must do so itself. But I want to bring you to the good news. The emergence of the Black Lives Matter movement internationally is an extraordinary phenomenon. It's a truly international movement against racism and for black liberation. And what's even more extraordinary is it has big support in the opinion polls, the last one I saw said that 40% of registered US voters said they would vote for Trump. 47% said they'd vote for Biden. But in the same poll, 53% of US voters say, said they supported Black Lives Matter. And the picture's the same here. Black Lives Matter is more popular than the political parties. 56% of the people polled in this country say they support Black Lives Matter. It's a huge movement, a popular movement, a militant and determined one. It's fighting against racism, for black liberation. We must relate to it one way or another. So we can stand on the sidelines and be bypassed. Or we can say that fighting racism is, is all about other people. Or we can be part of the Black Lives Matter movement. We can stand up to racism and anti-immigration sentiment in the country as a whole, in our own party. We can be part of a mass anti-racist movement. And like the United States Civil Rights Movement before it, we can keep our eyes on the prize. I know which choice I'm making. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak.
Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much, Diane. That was fantastic. Um, uh, I did actually forget to introduce myself at the at the start as well, which I should just mention. Um, I am Shivana Taj. I'm the General Secretary of the Wales TUC, um, and uh, I've been a long-standing trade unionist about 19 plus years now. And um, every single thing that Diane has mentioned is absolutely correct, particularly um, highlighted during this period of COVID. Um, and I think that the, the Black Lives Matter uh, movement has actually demonstrated that there is a, a clear need for collectivity, for collective action, for liberation and freedom, and that people have had enough. But equally, what's different this time is, is that you've got a wider group of people who are prepared to stand in unity, um, in struggle together. For, for a better world. So I'm actually personally really excited by Black Lives Matter. And um, I think that, you know, many of the, the new people that we are seeing coming up, they are going to be the future leaders um, of the Labour Party. So, you know, let's let's watch, watch this space. So thank you. Thank you, Diane. Um, our next speaker is Madge Dresser. Um, Madge is the Honorary Professor of um, History at the University of Bristol. And she's going to be talking to us about the, the Bristol bus boycott. Now, anyone that's an organizer or an activist um, in the labor movement, particularly if you're a trade unionist, um, if you haven't heard about this, uh, about the Bristol boycott, uh, this is going to be really exciting for you. Um, if you have heard about it already, I am sure that Madge is going to bring something new um, yet again. So Madge, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shav, and thank you, everybody, uh, uh, who's been organizing this. Um, well, I, I uh, would love to respond to some of the take of, of history that Diane had, but uh, perhaps later in the question uh, and answer uh, session. Um, I uh, speak as a long-term uh, member of a, a trade union, uh, NAPFI, and um, uh, I, I uh, have been an academic historian both at Bristol Polytechnic, the University of uh, the West of England, and then laterally um, uh, uh, Bristol University's honorary professor, but I've also been a social activist all my life and campaigning uh, in my small way uh, in public history for a, a, about uh, ethnic injustice and, and, and racial discrimination. Um, and so I want to focus on the work I did on the Bristol bus boycott of 1963, which remained completely undocumented until I wrote a pamphlet in the 80s uh, called Black and White on the Buses. And both the boycott itself and the circumstances attending the research, publication, and reception of my study highlight in a concrete and accessible way many of the contradictions and tensions about racism which characterize both the Labour Party and the trade union movement, not only in the 1960s, but also in the 1980s. And I think they still, these same issues keep coming up uh, today and they, they still have relevance in the era of Black Lives Matter. So if you think it would be helpful for me to remind people about the bus boycott story, uh, I will do. Um, uh, and uh, basically, um, people are very surprised to learn that racial discrimination in Britain was completely legal. Uh, there were no laws against it until the late 1960s with anti-discrimination acts coming in 1965, 1968, etc. And these were also passed at the same time as anti-immigration acts. So that, that's something to remember. But what had happened in Bristol, and Bristol, as you know, historically was a, a port that grew rich on the proceeds, not just of the trade and enslaved Africans uh, from um, the West Coast of Africa over to the colonies, but also in the whole sort of triangular trade, the, the whole uh, beginnings of globalized capitalism. Uh, and um, so what, what we have is a city that really didn't want to acknowledge the debt that it owed to the labor of enslaved Africans and to other people who were colonized, including people in, in the, um, uh, the, the Asian subcontinent. Now, in the 1960s, um, well, in the 1950s, there are very, very few uh, people of color in Bristol. And um, a few began to come during World War II uh, uh, and uh, you had uh, in the 1960s a very small enclave of mainly Jamaican, but some Barbadian 
uh, and small island people coming from the Caribbean and also people from um, uh, um, uh, India and Pakistan. Now, Bristol was undergoing huge amounts of change at this, at this time. Uh, the inner city, which had been blitzed and bombed out, uh, was seeing white flight because people were going to the suburbs or going to out, outlying areas, uh, both middle class and working class people. And you had a kind of vacuum of, of unclaimed houses there. And um, so when uh, black people first started coming to uh, Britain, uh, they did uh, settle in these uh, inner city, what we now would call the inner city areas, and notably, supposedly St. Paul's, which some of you might have heard of. Uh, it's often seen that St. Paul's was a sort of black ghetto, and I think that's a misnomer because it actually is a very mixed race uh, area. But um, anyways, what happened was that it was perfectly legal in the 1950s and 60s for people to discriminate against um, uh, the, uh, the employment of black people. And in, despite the protestations of the trade union, unions, who at the time, and the Labour Party, were expressing solidarity with the anti-apartheid movement, uh, with international solidarity amongst workers of the world, Unite, et cetera. You had um, uh, groups, um, particularly local branches, passing dispute, uh, passing uh, 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 pronouncements that they would not work with black people on the buses as conductors or drivers. Now this went counter to the official policy of uh, national and regional trade unions, but no one said anything. Uh, a blind eye was turned. And um, what you got was the need for a black led group to begin to dispute this kind of complacency. And they did so with white allies, uh, but it was the first black led campaign, so far as we know, that was um, successful in countering and challenging uh, the, um, the ban on, um, uh, well, the, the uh, you know, overt racial discrimination. Now, in the 1960s, uh, you had several major players. You had, um, you had the um, branch unions, uh, uh, the, 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 the local branches, who did not want to work with black uh, drivers and conductors. It was okay if they were in the depot, uh, but uh, not, not as conductors. Now, why was this? And it was explained away by the regional organizers uh, and, and, and by people at the top as, well, these people are really worried about their jobs. They don't want to be undercut uh, uh, by um, uh, you know, cheaper workers. And this played into the hands of, uh, well, it's a very economistic uh, interpretation of, of racism. It was simply a, a Marxist interpretation, which said everything was down to the worries about undercutting labor, okay? I think that was only half the story because there was racism. When you think about the uh, education of many of the uh, white workers, they had been raised in um, pretty crummy schools. Education had just really been in state in the 1880s, not that long before. And uh, it, uh, people were told, you may be poor, but you're part of the great British empire and you're better than, and forgive me, this is a spoiler alert, using bad words and offensive words, but I'm using them as a historian, not because I approve of them. But you would sort of say, well, you're better than those darkies. And darkies, when I first came to Britain um, uh, from the States and from London, I was appalled to hear in Bristol the um, unusual use of the term darky and other um, really offensive terms, unselfconsciously, because people just didn't realize this is the way they had been brought up. That this was the kind of education that they were given. Anyways, the um, Bristol Omnibus Company uh, was colluding, was sort of saying, well, you know, we're discriminating openly against having black drivers and black conductors because uh, our workers don't want it. And there wasn't really this leadership on the part of the national and regional trade unions to dispute this. And so it was left to a group of uh, activists, including Paul Stevenson, uh, now um, OBE, and um, uh, who was not Jamaican. Uh, he had probably Jamaican forebears, but his family had been in, uh, the, um, in England for a number of years. And he had been, a number of decades, I should say, and he had been um, he had obtained 
uh, education and he became a youth worker, et cetera. He's terribly well-spoken and he was of, uh, he was light-skinned and he was a great spokesman. And when he came, first came to Bristol, he was appalled at, as a youth worker, he was appalled at the kind of uh, racial atmosphere uh, that um, was obtaining. And um, he met up with a group of people, largely Jamaican um, uh, people of the descendants of smallholders and people who were not as educated as himself, uh, who were um, also appalled and upset about the lack of discrimination. People who had worked their socks off, people like Ray Hackett, uh, Owen Henry, who had been an activist uh, in Jamaica and a, a very smart businessman and, a, and a, a, a racially and a, sorry, politically aware, and um, a number of other people whom I outline in detail in, in the uh, pamphlet, uh, and including women who were didn't get the sort of public uh, acknowledgement as leaders, but who were behind the scenes like Barbara Dettering. And these people began to uh, say, we must do something about this. We, we need to do this. And they found allies with leftists, um, uh, some communists and uh, uh, some um, uh, Methodists in the uh, uh, in the wider uh, uh, community uh, in Bristol. Uh, it, it, and um, particularly at Bristol University, you had a small coterie of students uh, who came to support uh, people uh, uh, who decided, inspired by the Montgomery bus boycott of 1955, and this is Paul Stevenson's inspiration, that they would stage a bus boycott uh, in, in, uh, 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 you know, against this racial injustice. And Paul Stevenson did a really um, clever thing. He got a telephone interview uh, with a very um, sort of saying, do you have a uh, vacancy, Bristol Omnibus Company, with a um, for a driver, and they said, "Yes, we do. We're looking for drivers. We're short. I've got just the person for you. He's a youth work. He's a, uh, a model student, and he's a fantastic guy. And uh, uh, can he come to see you?" And they said, "Yes, wonderful." And the minute then he appointed this young protege guy Bailey to come and show up at the interview. And the minute they saw him, they said, "Oh, sorry, the job's been taken." So he he was able to prove. Uh, in document no on certain terms that this discrimination was uh, coming to pass. So uh, in, in response to this, a boycott in a campaign was uh, instituted and it began to receive national attention. Uh, and um, uh, it, at the time, Tony Benn and um, Sir Larry Constantine, the cricketer, and um, uh, who was also a high level diplomat, uh, Harold Wilson, Anthony Lester, uh, in, in the Labour Party and a number of other people came on board and it became a national campaign. It was really showing up that British liberalism and tolerance uh, and its its distinctiveness from the racist South, you know, which was featuring in the Civil War, uh, Civil Rights Movement in the 60s, they weren't quite as good as they'd like to say. But there was this big ambivalence when I when I started to I decided to document the the story of this bus boycott because nobody was was documenting it. And I was documenting it in the 1980s. And um, people didn't want me to document it. It was a time that Thatcher was bashing the trade unions, that most left-wing people in both the trade union movement and the Labour Party had a class analysis, but the idea of race as a determinant of, of uh, uh, injustice was seen as, as simply a, a side product. And uh, nobody wanted to give ammunition to bash the unions in the 1980s. And some people said, what, what's a white person doing, in, you know, non Bristolian at that, coming out from outside to uh, uh, look at our city? Or why are you doing black history? And I said, it's not black history, it's everybody's history. And we need to document it. And we, I, I interviewed both black and white um, uh, people, bus drivers, uh, the, the campaigners, people who favored the... Um, uh, the, the ban on, on, on black people. I, I tried to uh, get everybody's worldview to see where they were coming from and to get it out there. And I met a lot of resistance and a lot of silencing. And I think what Diane said about the fact that nobody wants to admit that they were um, uh, implicated in um, uh, you know, the, the collusion uh, with racism uh, is, is, uh, is, is still uh, obtains today. Nobody wants to own up and I think that there were uh, various reasons uh, for that that are embedded in the history of the Labour Party. Both uh, Paul Stevenson and Ron Nethercott, who were regional advice, uh, who was a regional um, uh, uh, lead for the uh, uh, Transport and General Workers Union at the time, uh, were Christians. 
And they both um, thought that they were being um, moral people. But for Ron Nethercott, the big determinant of injustice and exploitation was class. And for Paul Stevenson, the big determinant was race. They just saw the world completely differently. And they also saw the, um, the idea that, um, uh, well, the trade union movement and the labor movement said, we treat everybody the same. They just didn't get the fact that uh, the needs and the issues uh, and the injustices facing black workers uh, coming in were different. And we find over and over again, and the Bristol boycott exemplifies that, that unless black people took action themselves collectively with their white allies when they could find them, uh, they would not get anywhere uh, within the mainstream union, uh, despite the union professing these ideals of uh, you know, solidarity and treating everybody the same, et cetera. Now, there's a lot, if you read the pamphlet, I've done two, uh, 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 they're, they're free online, you can get them, um, but uh, uh, you can look at both the 1960s one I did as a member of the Workers' Writers Federation, Bristol Broadsides, which I did uh, without any kind of um, sponsorship or help with, from uh, Bristol Polytechnic at the time, I did it independently. And then I did a, another one, which was um, a commission by trade unions uh, including Unison and NUJ and, and various other people uh, 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 in, in 2016, I think it was. So you get the, you'll get an idea of how the the rhetoric um, uh, about denial changes, and the very fact that immigration, uh, the trade union and labor party movement, were were saying they were colorblind and treating everybody the same, but they were really not acknowledging a couple things. And one was the fact that they were all for, you know, racial equality in theory, but in practice, uh, they dragged their feet. And I think this is so true even now with BLM, everyone's in favor of, you know, racial um, uh, um, equality, but actually just uh, not doing stuff about it or turning a blind eye or letting bureaucratic inaction mean that nothing really changes structurally is, this, is, is in its way just as bad and perhaps more insidious than the people who are upfront and openly racist. Um, the other thing that it um, it shows is that um, immigration needs to be talked about honestly. The fears uh, and and uh, worries of uh, white uh, uh, people in the country uh, needed to be challenged, but also unpacked and listened to. And um, what I found when I talked with the bus drivers, um, both black and white, when, uh, when it all happened uh, and when the, the, the bus boycott was successful and it did uh, end formally uh, race discrimination, a couple things uh, were notable. One was that there may have been a secret quota system instituted uh, so that a small number of black people were allowed in um, and that it was the people who were not too militant who got the first jobs. And I thought that was quite interesting. There was a, a lot of um, structural and subtle uh, racism uh, going on and, and continuing to this day. Um, so I think, um, to because I'm running out of time, I'm sorry. Uh, we're, uh, it, have a look at these, these uh, two pamphlets because they do tell you the whole story and they do elucidate the themes that are still with us today. The, the uh, you know, the rhetoric is great, but the action is foot dragging on the part of both the Labour Party and uh, many trade unions, not all. And of course, no institution is a monolith. There were people, politicians and people uh, in and outside the trade union labor movement who really did care, but they seemed only to get any mileage when uh, it suited the interests of other uh, uh, vested interests uh, uh, at the time. So the, um, I think the, the message is to keep pushing, uh, to um, always challenge uh, you know, the rhetoric and compare it to the action, but also to listen to the anxieties of people, uh, to understand why people think the way they do and not simply dismiss them or counsel them uh, because they are not talking in politically correct language. We need to understand why people feel the way they do. Um, in order to challenge it effectively. I think I'll stop there. Thank you. 
Thank you, Madge. That was really interesting. And again, so much of what you have said just speaks volumes because it's still so it, it is the reality um, to a large extent, even though, you know, the, the trade unions have somewhat on paper got better um, at um, having structures that are supposed to be self-organized and are meant to be there to allow black members to campaign and organize on matters that they believe are mo of most importance to them whether or not they actually end up um, on the um, on the list when it comes to those annual negotiations or any of the talks that you might be having with the employer um, is um, is yet to be seen if I'm honest with you and it, it can be extremely difficult for for a number of voices to to be heard and to be included, um, and I think this does go back to the the power dynamics, as you've as you've said, and the, and the structural inequality that exists. So yes, the trade unions have got a long way to go, as does the Labour Party. So um, I'm going to be um, taking you um, over to our, um, and I'm hoping that Amrit's uh, camera is now working. Um, so we've got um, Amrit Wilson, um, she's a writer and an activist, oh she's on my screen, there she goes, um, on issues of race and gender in uh, Britain and South Asian politics. Um, Amrit is going to be talking about the, the Grunwick strike, which again is a really good example for um, anyone that's, you know, um, already an activist, an organiser, um, or whether, you know, it's, you, you're probably going to get loads of ideas again. And, and it's always really nice to hear other people unpack yourself. You might get one version of events when somebody else presents it, particularly somebody who has, um, you know, um, uh, kind of studied this issue as, a, as an academic as well. Um, you get a different take. So Amrit, over to you. Thank you. Sorry, Amrit, your um, mic is currently muted. Yeah. I think you're going to need to unmute okay. yourself. Yeah. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me to speak here. Um, thank you to the Socialists of Colour and uh, Labour Against Racism and Fascism. Um, I have very mixed feelings when I'm asked to speak about Runwick. Because on the one hand, I'm very happy because it evokes those very intense memories um, there was, you know, it's a very hot summer, 1977, and um, everyone who was an activist flocked to the Grunwick picket line. Um, it, the scenes were amazing. I mean, it was a street of ordinary terraced houses, but there was this mass picket with Asian women at the heart of that. And then there were amazing days like, you know, when Arthur Scargill came le leading a whole sea of, mi of miners behind him. Um, and of course, there was horrific brutality from the police um, and really vindictive violence. But um, I also remember the crushing sense of defeat because Grunwick's was a defeat. It was a betrayal by the TUC and, and the trade union leadership, and also by the left, we have to admit. So I can't help thinking, what if, what if there had been no betrayal? What would it have meant for, for us today even? Because here was a mass movement with workers of color at its heart, challenging the state and the employer. But the left did not recognize this. I think. And yet, I'm always asked to speak about Runwick, and other people are asked as well. Runwick is a favorite topic for the labor movement. And I sometimes wonder why, because there were so many other strikes before Runwick and after Runwick of Black workers and Asian workers. Um, there was the Wolf rubber factory strike in 1965. There was the, the Mansfield Hosier strike in 1972, those imperial strike 
uh, 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 um, this just went on. Uh, what characterized all of these? Okay, I don't know if it's, I need to do it. Okay. Um, okay, right. So uh, all of these strikes did not um, lead to that much interest. In every single one of these strikes, racism was an issue. But in these strikes, the union was always the first hurdle the workers had to, had to clear. So either the union would be inactive, uninterested, or in some places they would actually be complicit with the racism of the employer. And they were always against the community supporting the workers. Although in fact, the strikes which were won, like the Mansfield Hosiery strike, was actually won because it had community support. So, you know, you wonder why then is there this interest in Brunswick? Is it because it ticks all the boxes? It is Asian women, vulnerable workers being supported by white experienced trade unionists. Does it sort of, does it touch that sort of vein of that nerve of um, real paternalism which runs through the labor movement? In fact, you can see it in some of the imagery too of Jaya Ben Desai, the strike leader standing um, standing in, on the picket line and a huge white hand on her shoulder, which belonged to one of the, one of the uh, trade union officials. Um, so um, one, one thinks about it a bit more, one realizes that Grunwick, perhaps what hurts one most about Grunwick is that Grunwick could have been won. It should never have been defeated. Because for those who may not remember, it was a small photo processing plant which was dependent on postal deliveries. Um, pictures would be developed and then postal workers would take them and send them off to their owners. So um, the postal workers in that area were willing and in fact eager to support the Groundwick strike by boycotting the mail. But the, uh, the uh, unions were not keen on this, the union leadership. And at the height of the strike, the, um, the union which supported, the, which uh, the workers belonged to, the strikers belonged to, Apex, which is actually now GMB, decided that th there should be no mass pickets. And this is unbelievable when the, uh, the strike was about to be won. And at around the same time, you have the Postal Workers Union punishing those particular postmen who had come out in support of Grunwick. And then you had the TUC passing an edict saying that ir irresponsible elements uh, were creating problems and that they were undermining the union. And the reason for this was that the unions have always been willing to compromise with the right-wing labor leadership. And that was the, the, the government in power at the time, James Callahan's government, um, was a government, I think, very similar to what we would see if Keir Starmer came, came into power. Um, so, I mean, James um, Callahan was also the prime minister who had, under whom the most racist immigration laws had been passed. Um, and then the, in addition to this, there was the question of the trade union bureaucracy, which wanted to keep control and had a real paranoia about black and Asian workers um, taking control of the strike, of, of strikers actually leading it and the community supporting them. And the scale of this paranoia is, um, you can gauge it if you see a film called Women of 10 Downing Street which is a film about the Bunsen strike in the 90s. And it was made with the help of the strikers and with the community organizations. And in that film, you actually see um, the, um, the trade union official threatening the strikers um, if they continue to, to take, the, uh, take help from the support groups. Um, and of course, you know, the support groups had been there all through in all the strikes. They were, not, uh, they were not allowed to function in a number of strikes, but they were always there willing and eager because they knew that these were organizations like the Indian Workers Association, 
um, AWAS, the South Asian Women's Group, which I was part of, um, Black Workers Support Groups in the Bansa Strike, and so on. Amrit, we seem to have, you seem to have frozen. Um, Is it possible for you to turn um, your camera off and just have your volume, please? I'm not simply, you know, to be honest, it's of housing, that means, um, have, have you lost me? We, we keep losing you, and I'm just wondering, if, if you were to turn your video off and we just had the volume, maybe we would have less sort of cutting out? Okay, let me see. Is that, is that better? Do Thank you. you. So I was talking about the paranoia which the union bureaucracy felt for black workers and Asian workers support groups from the community. Um, and the, the thing, you know, these, this was exposed in um, a film made about the Bernsell strike in the 1990s, where you actually saw the trade union official uh, threatening the workers for being um, friendly with people in the community or taking help from a support group. Um, the film is something worth watching. It's called Women of 10 Downing Street. And again, what's interesting is that um, the um, GMB union um, had that film blocked. They um, stopped it from being broadcast after one screening by Channel 4. There's one last thing I'd like to say, um, which I think is quite crucial. And that is that in our era, um, the, the issue of community support becomes extremely important. And that's why we see the new in unions like the uh, United uh, Voices of the World, the UVW or the IWGB actually winning strikes because they do work with the community. And this is the difference. And as neoliberalism develops further and becomes more fascistic, we will find an increasing need for this. What with zero hour contracts, the hostile environment and so on. Um, finally, I'd like to just say that um, the, um, the Grandwick strike was really never anti-racist. The fact that white trade unionists joined it in support does not really show anything because it really was never projected as about fighting racism. Although the workers there face the most humiliating conditions and treatment. It was always projected as for um, union um, recognition. And in that sense was an existential struggle for the trade unions. And it's interesting in this context um, to, um, to look at a, a poster in the um, uh, People's History Museum in Manchester, which says, uh, which has someone from the Groundwick strike holding up a slogan, uh, a placard with the slogans, we are, we are fighting um, exploitation, um, uh, we are fighting uh, bad conditions, and then um, someone had written, we are fighting racial discrimination, and that bit had been scrubbed out. So it's, it's really worth remembering this when we, we talk about um, the Labour Party and the trade unions and the left in general fighting um, racism, that you know perhaps at the end of the day, they really never have done so because they have not allowed um, those who face racism to speak out. And that is a big challenge to make our voices heard. And I think Black Lives Matter is a very, very um, hopeful sign that things might change. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Amrit. Um, and again, 
Uh, plenty of, uh, uh, well, there's been lots of different questions that we've had and, and comments in the box that we will pick up um, as we um, go on. Um, just to say that um, uh, before taking on uh, the role that I'm currently in, um, I was a union official for the uh, Public and Commercial Services Union, PCS, um, and we have, um, you know, organized and had groups of workers, cleaners, security guards, um, many from uh, Black and Asian minority ethnically diverse backgrounds and communities um, who have been striking and, you know, the union has been supporting them. And we have one living wage and we have been working with, um, you know, a number of uh, community groups and organizations as well. So there are some really good examples out there. Um, but equally, there is still a lot more that can be done. And um, what we have uh, also seen, um, what I have personally experienced too um, during uh, the, the pandemic is that actually um, there is a, a real need for the trade union movement to be working much more closely with uh, communities around them. And um, how else are we going to do that? And how else are we going to um, expand our membership um, and our base if we don't actually um, organize both from a grassroots level um, into our workplaces? Because our workplaces are you know, equally our communities too. So, um, so that was just me um, adding my little bit in there. But I, I, I do recognize that, as I say, there's loads of, there's still lots of work to be done. And there are, you know, there's a number of grievances and there's often a lot of red tape when it comes to trade unions and, and much of that, those structures, et cetera. In, you know, trade unions, ultimately, we are a fabric of society. And, you know, we do live in a country that is structurally um, in, unequal. And we do have systemic um, racism and so forth and discrimination. So there are lots of barriers and, and it is important that the more of us who are active um, in our trade unions, um, equally in the Labour Party too, the more chance we have, fighting chance we have of actually winning and dismantling um, those um, uh, structures that stand in front of us and you know are aiming to stop us from progressing and improving um, our daily lives. So that takes us on. Um, nicely to um, our final speaker of the panel for today. And um, that is um, Mohamed El Naim, who is a PhD student at the University of Cambridge and um, has a note on He was a participant in the revolution in Sudan and has been fighting for the the first wave of Black Man Traffic protest in 2014. Um, Mohammed is going to be talking to us on um, this uh, for an international uh, Black politics in the discussion. So that's actually a, a nice discussion point to kind of end on before we go to um, the discussion. I can hear some background noise. I'm not sure who that is, but I'm going to mute myself and hopefully maybe that will um, balance things out. So thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. So uh, I think I'd probably start to begin with the very controversial statement that Keir Starmer made about us being in a moment. And I think what he tried to say when he used the word moment was that this was a temporary distraction from the broader project of rebuilding um, labor along Blairite lines. But um, there is another way in which we can uh, see this as a moment, and we can see it as a moment within a broader history of a strong anti-racist traditions in the labor movement here in Britain, but also more worldwide. Um, now, the things that we've talked about today have been mainly focused on um, 1960s, the 1970s and 1980s. And they were a lot, for, they were really related to things like racism in the workplace, but also racism in the community and the color bar, the difficulties of different communities to move past the color bar that prevented them from being active participants in society. But there is also an older tradition that often gets discounted or left out when we tell the stories of anti-racism in this country. And I'd like to talk about the early anti-colonial traditions in the first decades of the 20th century in the 20s and 30s and 40s, where you had people who were sent um, from the colonies to come and study, to become the new colonial technocrats that would uphold the colonial system back at home. And what, you, what ended up happening is, in the process of them feeling racism here in Britain, 
feeling disillusioned by being equal subjects under the crown, they ended up rebelling against that calling and started agitating for independence. Now, th this group, by all means, was not um, naturally inclined to do so. You know, they went there patriotic, they went there as Christians. And what that meant was that it took them a long time for them to get disillusioned, but also to see themselves in common cause against this common opponent, which was British colonialism. And the reason why I say that is because this was a tradition of organizing, which looked outwards. It was one that was more internationalist, and it meant that people from as far as Nigeria, Sierra Leone, and even the Caribbean colonies came together under a shared understanding that the racism they feel is not just because of discrimination in Britain, but because of the colonial system that Britain is upholding abroad. And they came and understood that they may use their technical skills that they've developed to agitate for independence. And so what that meant was that just as much energy was put into fighting discrimination in the universities, in the workplaces and in the neighborhood, as it was to fighting discrimination abroad. You had organizations like the International African Service Bureau, which was founded by people like George Padmore and CLR James, telling workers in Britain about the stories of workers that were on strike in Jamaica, right? You had, an under, you had a proliferation of newspapers, which let people feel a sense of kinship with workers across the colonies, both the working class here in Britain and workers maybe in Jamaica, in Trinidad and Tobago, in Nigeria. And there was an understanding then that to be a worker wasn't just to be a British worker or a Sierra Leonean worker or whatever country that you're from, but it was to be part of an international working class. And I think that it's really important to understand that the international is always related to what's going on locally. There was a similar dynamic that happened in Portugal were some of the first leaders of the liberation struggles of Mozambique and Angola and Cape Verde and Guinea-Bissau all met together and also had an internationalist politics. And it was from within the metropole when they betrayed their calling to uphold colonialism and started organizing against it, that they were able to build the kind of liberation movement in the Portuguese colonies, which would aid in the freedom of Portugal in democracy at home. And so to see the interconnectedness between what happens abroad and at home is something that I feel we need to start to look at today, right? Another thing that's also important then is that if this phase that I'm talking about was a phase of internationalism, an international kind of anti-racism, then the, the phases that we've talked about earlier today from the 60s going on to the 80s were also about building solidarity in the face of, the, in the face of barriers to being equal in society. And these weren't just about being an equal citizen in Britain. They were also deeply inspired by third world liberation struggles which were happening abroad, whether it was in Vietnam, whether it was in Argentina and Latin America. These kind of struggles animated groups here in Britain and they animated the political imagination of those groups. Now, if those are sort of two moments, then maybe the moment that we're in is the moment of the 21st century where Unfortunately, I would like, you know, I'd say uh, internationalism hasn't been as vibrant as it has been in the past. But nonetheless, there have been very clear uh, campaigns that are angry at things like deaths in police custody here in Britain, extrajudicial killings of black people abroad in the United States and other different countries. And I think it's from that perspective that we also have to say, what can we learn from the other moments that can strengthen us? Now, about two years ago, I went to Sudan and I joined the revolution. I'm of Sudanese descent. I joined the revolution in Sudan. And I've heard similar complaints of friends in Haiti and et cetera, is that in a time of immense social revolt happening across the world, it seems sometimes that our anti-racist imaginations are sort of siloed into our, our countries, as if the only concern of black people in America or of black people in Britain or other people of color in these countries is to make our countries more inclusive. And so there was a sense and feeling almost of abandonment by the very movement that I had given so much to when I was in Sudan, just as much as I've heard from friends in Haiti, just as much as I've heard from friends across the African diaspora. And it goes both ways as well. Now, the great thing about the George Floyd moment within the broader moment of anti-racism in this country is that it's gotten everyone to come together, not just black people, but people of all 
races to fight for racial justice. And they've been able to use the experience of George Floyd to talk about the particular ways in which racism operates in their own countries. But the next step should be for there to be a sense of kinship of the kind that I was talking about in the early periods during the anti-colonial period so that people have a sense of feeling that they care about what happens to uh, a Haitian whose neighborhood has died. They care about what happens to two boys who were killed for picking coconuts in the wrong neighborhood in Guyana. They care about all of these different problems happening across the world. And once we get to that point, we will be able to build the kind of international movement that is against xenophobia, that is against the kind of other international movement which seems to be winning right now and which much of the left feels they need to concede ground to. I'm talking about the Bolsonaro's of the world, the Modi's of the world, the Trump's of the world, and the Boris Johnson's of the world, who are part of an international movement that tells you to hate the other, that hell tells you to hate the immigrant, that tells you that those workers across the border have nothing to do with you, and that those workers who are dying in the Mediterranean should drown, because why are they coming here to take our benefits anyway? That's the kind of, pol that kind of politics is only antidote is the kind of internationalism I'm talking about. And whether we may not see it now, just as the people in Portugal did not see the anti-colonial struggles of the Portuguese colonies help aiding them in their struggle for democracy, the building that kind of international politics is going to be necessary for reconstructing labor after the kind of feeling of despondency and regret that we felt since the last elections. There's no reason for us, in other words, to feel pessimistic when George Floyd, the, the movement uh, for justice for George Floyd and other black people has infused the movement, movement with new energy, right? There's also just one more thing I'd like to say before concluding, is that from the 60s, if, if internationalism is what we needed to learn from the first era that I'm talking about, of anti-colonial struggle, then in the 60s and 70s and 80s, there's another thing, and that is solidarity. See, the, the very idea of anti-racism, it's not that we believe that these races that we are siloed into are in fact real. It's needing to build solidarity in spite of suspicion that we have. There is nothing natural, there is no natural affinity that I might have with someone who's black. And that's something that needs to be constructed and it's going to be a difficult process. Even in South Africa today, you have Nigerian immigrants who are attacked by other South Africans who are seen as being outsiders and foreigners. So there's no natural black solidarity there. There's not, there never was a natural black solidarity in South Africa between Indians and black people who are, who are African people who are both considered under the category of black in spite of the apartheid regime trying to divide those communities. And what I'm seeing is a tendency very recently of different communities saying that they're suspicious of other communities, whether that would be saying that we believe that, I don't know, Indians and other different groups of people are anti-Black, or whether it's Native Americans saying that all of these different people, they don't care about our land question. You know, this kind of suspicion is becoming popular. And I feel like it's almost a form of social capital today to say that you're against anti-racist projects of building common solidarity because you believe that these groups are anti-Black or these groups are anti-this or anti-that. The reality is that building solidarity means overcoming mutual suspicion, not naturalizing it. So what that means is that it's never been easy in the first place. And we really need to go back to building a politics of common solidarity as the basis for an anti-racist socialist movement. And that's all I've got today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mohammed. That was fantastic. And uh, this bit about um, suspicions and solidarity in spite of uh, suspicions amongst communities is um, very real. And I'm, I'm glad that you have uh, ended on that point because, uh, again, there's been uh, lots of different comments in the in the chat box, um, and uh, which I am sure that we can pick up. But um, you know, bringing in you, you brought in a, a range of different issues. Ultimately, what you have uh, made us uh, really set up and think about, it, it really is about building solidarity, 
um, in order for us to overcome our suspicions and and regardless of our uh, of our suspicions that we that there really is no real reason for us to be feeling pessimistic at this moment in time, given that the uh, Black Lives Matter protests and the the killing of of George Floyd has actually given us something. Um, given us a gift almost, an opportunity for us to come together, to be able to share experiences, um, to share our stories and to find ways and means of uh, building solidarity amongst each other. So um, this brings us to an end as far as um, our panel speakers are concerned. Um, I have been um, picking up um, a range of different uh, sort of questions um, and, and if People can please don't forget to post your questions and comments um, in the chat uh, for the panel. And the first question that we are going to go to um, was from Theodora Polenta, who asked, why have the trade unions and the Labour Party had no organised presence on the great wave of demonstrations following the killing of George Floyd and the evolving Black Lives Matter movement? Um, so that was the, the question uh, that was posed. Um, so, um, I am going to go to Madge, if you, can you come in on, on that one, please? Sorry, Madge, you're currently muted. Oh, oh, am I? Am I now? I can't, uh, what do I do? Sorry. Oh, right. Okay, fine. I'm in the show. I'm not muted. Is that right? Yes. Uh, well, I think uh, the, um, again, I think it's this uh, uh, emphasis on, on class rather than race that has uh, perhaps uh, infused the trade unions and to some extent the Labour Party about this. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm really not uh, equipped to really look at uh, why the trade unions and Labour Party have had no organized presence. Um, I'm I think that, you know, as individuals, uh, specific trade unions, specific MPs have been following the, the protests. Um, but I I'm really, really have to sort of say I don't know enough to to uh, ratify uh, the, the, fact, the factual nature of that assertion. I ask uh, Mohammed if he wants to come in on that one at all. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm, I... I think that I would just say that it's most likely because of the fact that the George Floyd protests also coincided with uh, the pandemic. But nonetheless, I think there's also a sense and a feeling among many people um, that racial issues are not class issues, even though the way in which most of us live as class, as, as members of a class, especially if we're racialized, is through race. So, you know, Stuart Hall used to say that race is the modality in which class is lived. And once we get past this, um, this binary between what race is and what class is, we're hopefully going to start to see more people build the right kinds of political programs, which don't see these things as that's for equality and that's for labor. I think the two are really intertwined. Thank you. Um, I don't know if um, we have got uh, another question. I saw that there were there was a series of them that were posted up. Um, okay, so um, we've got another one from uh, Theodora Polenta again, who has asked: Would Labour majority councils make a pledge for the immediate resettlement of asylum seekers from the Asian hotspot camps to their city in a spirit similar to that of German um, municipalities? Um, I don't know if Amrit is still on the call, whether she wants to come in um, or whether um, I it's, I've got a, okay. Um, Ma oh, Madge maybe wanted to come in? I, I'll come in, it's okay. Okay, great, yeah. Um, yeah, um, I think, you know, Labour councils need to um, look at issues like asylum and so on, which they really have not done. I mean, I think it's, in a way, it's also up to us to pressurize them. And people within the Labour Party need to take up these issues a lot more than they've done. I mean, they're small pressure groups, but that's nowhere like anything, uh, you know, enough. Um, 
So, I, I mean, yes, uh, some of the labor councils are, are pretty right wing. They don't, you know, they don't do anything for the people here, let alone for asylum seekers. Okay, uh, great. Um, okay, um, I wonder if um, one of the uh, other panel members wanted to come in. I don't, I don't know, Madge, whether you wanted to come in, yeah? Yes, uh, I think um, th there are a number of reasons for this. First of all, never underrate bureaucracy. I mean, the, the suffering of asylum seekers uh, with uh, the bureaucracy in Bristol and the way that they have been treated and the the bureaucratic hurdles, it's torture by bureaucracy that they've had to jump through just to get benefits is absolutely horrendous. Uh, and it isn't, you know, um, the the council as a whole trying to be uh, punitive. It's it's it, a lot of it's bureaucracy and a lot of it is the um, the cri the COVID crisis and also the fact that. Um, uh, 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 a lot of people are hurting now with the uh, collapse of the economy of uh, both uh, black and white uh, and people of color. There's a lot of suspicion of asylum seekers. And so would that um, the, the more humane policies uh, that were referred to, you know, could be adopted would be great. But I think the other thing that we do have to recognize is that as a result of globalization and uh, neo-colonialism uh, and the kind of the, the whole policy of wars, uh, we have a huge and unprecedented demand uh, of people fleeing their countries in a desperate circumstances to come. Now, they can't all come to Europe. So what do we do with, unless we can somehow, um, in, in the short term or the, uh, the longer term, uh, reconstitute a more just global economy, uh, we're going to have a real problem. So I think it's a complicated, it's a really complicated issue. Uh, and we uh, have to look at these things specifically. But it would be uh, a great idea if we could at least uh, accommodate some of those people from the Aegean for the for the moment because they're in desperate circumstances. But you Thank don't you want man. you don't want you don't want to unleash and drive other people who are ignorant uh, or don't understand the the uh, circumstances into the uh, arms of the hard right because they feel that uh, labor is not listening to them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so our next question is from Paul Goddard, um, who has asked an interesting one, actually. Um, does the panel feel that religious tolerance and racial equality are similar issues? Does Islamophobia equate to racism? And should religion be able to influence politics? Um, and can I ask Mohammed to come in first, please? Yeah, sure, absolutely. So um, I think that it depends on how the conversation is being had. Um, the uh, it's I think today uh, there's been a cultural shift, especially because of the success of things like the Bristol Bus Boycotts that we described, but also the success of things like the civil rights movement in the United States. Um, and it's almost as if, um, you know, if you've, if you've ever asked someone who said something that's racist, um, you call them racist, they, they feel more offended even by the accusation than the potential that they actually might have said something racist. And that's, that's something more cultural uh, that we have, right? Um, and in some kinds of ways, I feel that, though sometimes some people may have legitimate concerns with, for example, Islamism in Sudan, right? Um, more, more often, more often, um, Islam becomes a euphemism in which, you know, they're saying brown, but they're actually saying Muslim. Um, and, you know, Islam is destroying our way of life, et cetera, is, is more commonly accepted because many of them feel that they can hide behind the excuse of saying, that they're speaking out against religion uh, and the potential effects of religion, and they're not speaking out against a community, almost absolving themselves of the biggest sin that's possible, racism, um, but finding another way to do so. And, and the, the, the sort of covert ways in which racism operates today, I think, makes it like that. But that's not always the case. And so, you know, for me, as someone who's a socialist, I am committed to, um, to secularism, for example, and secular state. But nonetheless, um, you know, the, I don't feel that the far right uh, is being, you know, they're being very disingenuous when they say Muslims are threatening, you know, the secularism of Britain, whatever, because one, I mean, they, they, they tend to wave the Christian flag themselves quite often. Um, and two, uh, you know, that's not happening. You know, there is no sh creeping Sharia, et cetera, et cetera. And so it, what you re what's really going on is um, racists are feeling as if they have to hide behind um, Islamophobia, 
Uh, but that's that's not to say that we have to compromise and we have to say that religion should affect politics. I think personally, I'm I'm not ashamed to say it, that I don't think religion should affect politics. Um, but I don't think that a lot of these Islamophobic um, fake rhetoric that's coming from the right, um, there is no threat of that happening anyways, you know, so it's, it's overinflated, I think, by them. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed. Um, I don't know whether if um, Amrit wants to um, also come in on this question. Um, I'd like to say that um, when you think of Islamophobia in this country, we've got to remember that it's been very much tied into the war on terror, which certainly exacerbated. I mean, there was always Islamophobia because it was something which came out of colonialism. But um, the war on terror institutionalized it. And so we have a situation where there is massive surveillance, um, which is directed as, at Muslims. Um, and uh, the whole idea of the Muslim as a terrorist has, has become uh, almost uh, a kind of something in people's subconscious. Um, so it is, it is, in that sense, a form of racism. Um, it's also become a global thing, because you know when you think of all the wars that have been launched, so many of them have been launched on Muslim countries. And it's as though the lives of those people don't really matter. Again, if you look at what's happening in India, there's a massive, massive wave of Islamophobia. People are being, Muslims are being disenfranchised and so on. So it's very important for us to see Islamophobia as something very similar to racism, both in a global sense, as well as in the context of Britain. Having said that, I don't think it's a question of religion affecting politics. I'm a secularist myself. Um, but I think it's a question of recognizing that Muslims are being targeted in a way which is almost identical to the issue of race, except that in many ways it's more difficult to deal with because you are being presented with um, a trope which people have accepted of the Muslim as a terrorist. So I think it's, it's important for us to, to take this on board as a very serious issue, which is linked to race. Thank you. Thank you, um, Amrit. Um, we have uh, a couple of other uh, questions as well. So one of the questions is, what practical steps can trade unions take to inform members of the racists of the pa uh, past of the, uh, of the past movement? And is this a useful thing to do? Um, can I ask Madge to come in on that one, please? Can you just repeat it? I couldn't, you, 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 I couldn't quite hear that. Yeah, so the question was, what practical steps can trade unions take to inform members of the racist past of the movement? And is this a useful thing to do? I think some of the speakers have kind of, including yourself, sort of touched on this. So, um, you know, in terms of practical stuff, what can we do? Well, uh, first of all, thank you uh, for that. Um, first of all, I think that... Uh, uh, there should be some training of, of trade union shop stewards and people on, you know, on the, in the grassroots about re what racism is, uh, and not in a kind of uh, beat their heads over with a tire, tire iron, but in a, 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 a atmosphere which you're trying to recreate here of mutual respect, where people feel that they can talk honestly without sort of being cancelled or or uh, completely vilified, uh, but also to have their own preconceptions challenged and open to rational debate. So I think they're really, people don't understand. I've been talking to, uh, I have feet in all sorts of camps uh, uh, and, and I've been talking to some old white guys uh, in, 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 in middle-class entitled groups who uh, honestly didn't realize what white privilege meant and didn't think, they said, I'm from a working class background, how, how can I be white privileged? People don't understand some of these concepts and how uh, people have benefited from this. They don't understand uh, the dynamics of uh, what uh, racism um, uh, uh, means and uh, what religious intolerance means. So I think, you know, education is one thing. The other thing is measured by bloody results. Uh, there's all this rhetoric, but what's actually happening in terms of recruitment? I think one of the big things with trade union um, uh, and Labour Party recruitment is, uh, you know, you get people like us, people you can trust. You recruit people on social, your social networks. You ask friends and family uh, about who would be a good person and that kind of thing. And, and of course, people who are immensely talented never get a look in because they don't even know about some of these opportunities. So I think we really need to um, uh, 
completely revolutionized the it isn't simply having positive di discrimination and letting anybody in who doesn't have talents uh, or 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 meet a certain um, uh, skill sets that are needed for a particular job. It's getting to these uh, people who are outside those social networks. So I think that that's really, really important. And then you need big data. You need uh, you know, to measure by results, but you also need to talk to people and you have to marry up the qualitative and the quantitative. You have to marry up the um, uh, quantitative uh, data uh, and, 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 and interrogate on what basis are you measuring success? Because if you have certain um, targets, you're gonna get pen pushers who will just cynically um, uh, you know, meet the target in a kind of mechanistic way. And you really need to have uh, build organic links with the wider community, uh, both in the Labour Party and in the trade union movement. Uh, and when we say the wider community, I'm white working class as well as uh, people of color, we really need to uh, get beyond uh, our bureaucratic um, networks. Thanks, Madge. I feel like I was listening to myself then. <laughs> This is something that I talk about all the time. So, so thanks for that. Um, okay, so we've got um, another question um, from Tacey Tsikas. I think I've said, I might have said that completely wrong. So please do forgive me for my pronunciation. It's a question for uh, Mohammed about, um, and the question is, how do you think migrant solidarity can relate to international solidarity for people organizing in Britain? And is this work that should be done through the Labour Party? Mm, good question. Yeah, um, I mean, one of the things is, is that we need to get past this hang up where, you know, um, I think migrants, uh, especially refugees, are seen in sort of two different ways, um, either as people who are disingenuous men who are coming in and taking the jobs and pretending to be persecuted, or that they're just uh, victims of persecuted. That's the general public. I th I'd like to believe that the left has gone past that. Um, and so, you know, we need to move past those. But beyond that, I mean, the way in which someone here, for example, can say that, that um, they don't care about politics, that bifurcate politics from their own life, uh, it's not a possibility for someone who's usually a migrant. And so what you often have is that people who are migrants, um, they tend to be a mixed bunch, but there's a, a specific, a specific pattern that I've seen is they tend to care about politics or what's going on at home. A lot of them tend to be organizing in exile as well. And third of all, they also tend to be, um, you know, quite politically aware of how politics at their home is related to politics in Britain. One of the, the, th the difficulties often is, is the language barrier. Um, and the language barrier means that they're organizing in their own languages, in their own social networks, uh, usually tailored to the diaspora or usually tailored to audiences at home who might be using a VPN or something to see their, their media. Um, one of the things that the left can do is to not treat this stuff as diaspora politics and the politics here as being solely on migrant. What that means is, is that reach out to the groups in exile, to groups like the Campaign Against the Criminalization of Communities, to Kurdish movement groups, or to Ethiopian movement groups, or Eritrean movement groups, et cetera, um, and find out, you know, do a map of where the politics lies and see if, if, you know, there can be some common cause. A lot of conversations that can't be had in the countries at home, um, tend to, there's tend to be an opportunity for those kinds of conversations to happen here in Britain. Um, you could have conversations, for example, between the fractures in Syria, between Syrian communities and Kurdish communities. You can facilitate those kinds of conversations. Um, and you can facilitate conversations uh, within the Sri Lankan diaspora, et cetera, um, Muslim communities and progressive uh, communities who are, you know, maybe of Hindu religion or something. And that, that kind of politics is often seen as that's diaspora politics that we don't really care about. And this is migrant solidarity politics. But one thing is, is to actually get involved in that kind of politics and to also allow that to inform how we build our own programs here um, in Britain. And that I think could, could be true in any of the key destinations of uh, diaspora movements, diasporic movements. Thanks, Mohammed. Um and you've just mentioned uh, the uh, Kurdish movement and there is a, a trade union campaign called Freedom for Erdogan. Um, and I strongly recommend uh, if you don't already know about this campaign that you that you take a look. Um, you know, as uh, Mohammed and many of the speakers have referred is extremely important for us to not just organize it on a local level, 
but also build our solidarity and learn from each other on a on a on a much um, global scale as well, and show our solidarity and and build our unique links in that way as well, and facilitate discussions um, um, amongst those communities too, because ultimately that's how um, we um, we organize better and, and, and we win um, on a mass scale. So um, next, I am going to be um, asking. Uh, each of our panel members to uh, move to uh, the final closing remarks. Um, you each have between sort of three to four minutes to to just kind of um, maybe um, add on to some of the things that you've said already or whether you wish to, um, you know, refer back to some of the questions that we've had or whether, you know, there's some comments that came from, from some of the other speakers as well. Unfortunately, Diane had to leave us. Um, at the start, um, and, and again, you might want to, uh, because she had another meeting, but you may wish to refer back to some of the comments that Diane made as well, because they were obviously extremely important. So I'm gonna go through the uh, the order um, that we had. So if I can ask um, Madge first, please. Right, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, a, f a few things. I, I, uh, <clears throat> I, I thought it was uh, interesting and I was a little puzzled when, Diane talked about the history of uh, uh, racism within the labor movement, et cetera, and the way that Irish workers had uh, so suffered from discrimination and how, uh, uh, how, how redolent that was of what's happening today. While she also didn't mention the um, influx of uh, persecuted Jews in the 1870s and 80s who were accused variously of anarchism, sweatshop, capitalist exploitation, sex trafficking, you name it. Uh, and uh, but many of them were union members and, and campaigning for social justice. And so I, I just wa wondered why that omission uh, w w was uh, there. And also, I think um, when we talk about um, Islamophobia, uh, we've got a real problem in the in the socialist movement because we are uh, inheritors of an Enlightenment Eurocentric um, rationalist um, uh, tradition. And I I I. I uh, think that uh, the, the problem that we have in mobilizing people is that a lot of people, be they um, Muslim, Christian, um, uh, 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 Jewish, what have you, they have a, a, a um, they get comfort or uh, from their faith. Uh, and uh, some of that faith is deeply reactionary in terms of if they have a literal uh, a belief in a holy book, et cetera. This uh, can lead to homophobia, to suppression of women, et cetera. So we, but it does give people a sense of place and belonging. And I think we have to have some honest conversations about where uh, this all fits in to the kind of society that we want to, um, uh, to, to um, uh, live in. And we also need to have a honest conversation about dialogue between everybody and having difficult conversations with people of opposing views isn't gonna change everything, but I really echo Muhammad's um, uh, 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 insight that um, there are all sorts of dynamics and we can't just uh, divide things on straight racial grounds uh, because things are so fluid, so polarized, and that there's exploitation and bigotry within a lot of people's um, uh, groups. And we need to challenge that, even though we understand that the kind of most important kind of um, uh, racial, the, the most important impact of racial prejudice and uh, intolerance has come from the West and from Europe because of its historic position at this moment in time uh, in the global economy. Thank you, thank you, Madge. Um, can I ask um, Amrit to come in next, please? Right. Shall I? Shall I? Um, okay. Am I on now? Yeah. Um, I'd like to. For the first thing I'd like to say is that uh, trade unions um, historically had a very important role in education. Um, educating um, trade unionists on a whole host of issues. And now that education in terms of racism has really uh, dwindled. And I'm not on the whole in favor of this whole unconscious bias training. I think what we need to do is really do what Jeremy Corbyn had talked about um, in terms of educating people about our history, why people came here, um, and the various global uh, forces, and the fact that racism um, 
was not only just linked to colonialism, but that it's a continuing uh, aspect of um, of international relations and of um, of imperialism. So I think that education is really, really important. And the, if the trade unions could do that, it would make a big difference. Um, educate members, have, have time for them, uh, where these things could be discussed. I think the next thing I want to talk about is the whole way in which um, all of us, um, whether we are black or white or Asian or no, everyone, uh, um, believes in certain principles. And we and Sorry, Amrit, we, we're losing you. Um, uh, on the far right, we would say that we are anti, we are not racism, have to be not just spoken. Um, and then I, I'd like to um, look at the community's principles. Um, I'd like to give the example of the way in which um, certain Hindu groups have targeted the Labour Party as being anti-Hindu, simply for taking a stand on Kashmir or um, for uh, being even slightly critical of Modi. And this is a problem. Are we going to, is the Labour Party going to simply, um, you know, uh, appease people like this? Or is it going to take a stand? And I think it's our role as anti-racists to make sure that that at least the unions or the, and the left take a stand on this issue much more strongly than it has done. Um, and then my last point is just to emphasize um, what I said earlier, that um, the trade union bureaucracy needs to just look at itself and look at the strikes which are being won today, which are being won with the support of communities but in very difficult conditions. These are very inspiring uh, victories, which have been won by the UVW and the IWGP. And I think they provide a model from which tra the trade union um, leadership can learn. Um, so I think, you know, that those are some of the points I'd like to make. Thank you, Amrit. Um, thank you for, for those comments. And can I ask Mohammed, please, to come in? Hi, yeah. Um, I guess I would just echo what everyone else is saying. Um, first of all, the question on the question of conversations, um, going back to what Diane Abbott was talking about in the beginning, um, Karl Marx. For Karl Marx, when he was talking about the anti-Irish sentiment among the working class, he wasn't talking about it with some kind of, or solely because of some kind of moral concern with how Irish people feel. He was talking about the very basis in which the um, labor movement can win um, and socialism can win. Um, and that it's it's not just a, a matter of questions about bad sentiments. It's a matter of like building the right kind of political program that can be in the interests of all of the working class. And you know um, the concept of white privilege, although today we hear it so so popularly said, st actually started in a debate in the Students for a Democratic Society in the United States, and it was inspired by um, by Marx's uh, conversation on the Irish. And it was basically, again, saying it's not about changing the sentiments, but it was saying that white supremacy was actually kind of an alliance between um, white workers who didn't understand that their interests are aligned with those of black workers and immigrant workers, et cetera, with the, white cap the very white capitalists who were exploiting them. Um, and I think today also we have to take that concept and also understand that other kinds of um, forms of racial solidarity can be real racial solidarity. Um, and need it to unite the ranks of the working class, but they can also often also be used by, because of the inadvertent effect of opening up the color bar, that's meant that there's been people of different races who have been different capitalists. And one of the different capitalists are able to do is, they'll say that they represent their community, whether that's a black community, the Indian community, et cetera, and that they should turn, that they should try to get that community to turn against uh, other communities. And it's actually in the interests of those capitalists of very different colors. Um, who actually have more in common together and wine and dine together and live together and visit each other's parties and weddings, et cetera. 
um, they get us all to fight against each other. Um, but it's not just about that. It's also about the structure of society itself was built in such a way where we really have to identify. And so difficult conversations is one thing, um, but it's also about building the right political programs. I mean, you know, um, just the conversation that we had right now was very insightful, especially on the question of the way the BJP says that you're anti-Hindu if you go against their policies in Kashmir. Um, you know, Turkey says the same thing, that if you have anything to say about the way they, they treat Kurdish people or the horrible conditions in which Abdullah Öcalan is right now, the, the leader of, uh, to many Kurdish people, the leader of their struggle in prison, um, their refusal to enter into a peace process, they'll say that that's Islamophobia. And, you know, the um, Israeli government does the same when you have something to say about the occupation, about the all of the obstacles that have been put in place of a two-state two solution, they'll say that that's anti-Semitism. And we have to be able to differentiate between that kind of cynical exercise, which in fact is the most disrespectful thing because it weaponizes a very real problem for the purpose of political, for, 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 the, for the purpose of like political gain. And we also have to recognize that we do have to fight against anti-black racism in the Labour Party. We do have to fight against anti-Semitism in the Labour Party. We do have to fight against anti-Hindu uh, sentiment or whatever that we find. Um, so it's we have to be careful. The, the moment that we're in, it's not like it was before. You know, It was unambiguous in the moment that I was talking about in the early 20th century, that the colonizer is that one opponent. Now we have to take a step back and really look at all of the interests at play because the boundaries of who the elite are and who the elite aren't, that's opened up. And there are people playing games. And so there was there were moments when, you know, before they've co-opted some of the discourses of anti-racism um, that we've used uh, for their own gain. And so we have to be careful on the left. Um, and so, you know, that means fighting racism in the workplace. It also means having a more internationalist politics, but most importantly, an internationalist politics focused on the global working class because there's some times in which race and gender and every different kind of thing can hoodwink us. And even a, a so-called class politics can hide, can hide the way it's being co-opted by the elites um, to actually divide us and not, and not help us forge the kind of real socialist movement that we need to, we need to build. Thanks, Mohammed. And that was completely spot on. I can't disagree with anything that you have uh, just said. Um, there was, um, we are going to be um, wrapping up, but, but there was a, a question actually that was posted um, by uh, Malaz Al Naim. Um, and her question, or I, uh, well, the question, should I say, was should British schools teach British colonial history with slavery? And do you believe this would be a good route to build a more tolerant country? Well, um, as somebody who lives in Wales, um, I'd like to say that that is going to be happening. Uh, we have got a Labour government here. Um, we have a first minister who is a socialist. Um, he was, um, he is, um, you know, he is a socialist through and through and works very closely with the trade unions and a range of different grassroots organisations. Um, and the unions have really been, um, the teaching unions in particular, schools unions have been pushing for, for this to happen. Um, so we are, um, that is going to happen. That is going to be a part of our curriculum here. Um, and uh, there's a, a group that has currently um, been set up as well, um, led by um, a black professor. So it's going to be interesting to see how all of that pans out. Um, so maybe in future, we can share some more information about um, how that's actually gone. Um, so um, before uh, we go, there was a couple of things that I just wanted to, um, first of all, say was thanks to our interpreters, uh, thanks to the tech team and the organizers of the World Transformed. Um, and thanks to everyone, one, every one of our speakers um, who joined us today, all of our panel members, you were all absolutely fantastic. Uh, thank you to each and every one of you for joining us as well um, and um, for all of your questions. Now, we weren't able to, to pick up on every single one, um, but there is the opportunity for you to continue on um, the discussion so you can actually access the, the World Transformed Community Forums on um, community.theworldtransformed.org forward slash login. Um, so that is where you're going to be able to carry on uh, with the discussion as well. There's also the opportunity to register for other events. Um, you know, you know, the World Transformed events, there's lots of different ones that are coming up and they fill up really quickly. Um, so make sure that you uh, register uh, for those as well. 
And then finally, um, there is a, a supporters network too. So if you have enjoyed this session and you'd like us to help sustain our work throughout this festival and beyond, please consider supporting us um, at theworldtransformed.org forward slash support forward slash. So thank you, absolutely amazing, uh, you know, brilliant panel, every single one of you. And thank you to each and every one of you. And thank you to the World Transform for allowing me the opportunity to, to kind of be your host today. So thank you, everyone. Uh, look after yourselves and we'll see you soon. View the full TWT20 program and become a supporter today to help us deliver political education all year round at theworldtransformed.org.